Okay, so we'll start our question and answer session now. So just take a moment and reconnect with your motivation and reground yourself. Okay, and um, I wanted to, before I forget, tell you about a book that was very recently published that is kind of my new favorite book about Mahamudra. It's so clear, it's so beautiful. Um, it's called Mastering Meditation, and it's by His Eminence Chodin Rinpoche, who was, um, as you guys know, one of my greatest teachers who passed away a few years ago. Um, the translators and other students finalized some transcripts um, from his previous work. So it's all about Mahamudra meditation, as well as Shine Shamata and bringing everything together. So mastering meditation. Um, okay, so the first question was related to one of the morning meditations and how to stay grounded if we're detached from thoughts. And I don't know if I'm paraphrasing it accurately, but it, words to that effect, how to stay grounded. Um, and there's a few ways. Um, one way is Yang Zirim Shea recommends doing a round trip meditation. Yeah, a round trip meditation, which sometimes I do um, as well. And sometimes I've led you guys through as well, where you know you do body, breath, awareness of thoughts, more awareness of clarity of mind, and then back to awareness of thoughts, back to awareness of breath, back to the body. So you kind of do a round trip with your meditation. So you finish with body awareness, you know, of course your dedication, but you kind of re-center yourself in your physical experience before you stand up and go into your in-between session time. So uh, this kind of round trip attitude can be really useful for staying grounded after a meditation where you've been particularly um, detached in a healthy way from your thoughts, doing one of these non-reactive clarity of mind meditations. Um, you know, another thing that came to me is that you're in a similar state with your patients, I think, when you're listening very deeply, you're listening very attentively, but you're trying not to crowd their words with your own impressions, right? This is the sense I get when you guys describe your work, is that it's very active, it's very awake, but you're not inserting yourself into their narrative. So the way that you listen to your patients non-reactively, can you bring that quality to listening to your own thoughts non-reactively? Similar skill, just kind of transferring its location. So that was an idea that came to me is that you already have that skill. You can just shift it to the cushion as well. Um, if you're feeling really disassociated after a meditation, that's a sign that you went into the wrong space with it. And so there was some vagueness or sleepiness or heavy laxity or something that you really went into a dreamy, hazy half sleep, which is not meditation, but might just mean that you need more sleep. <laughs> so if that happens a lot, it might be that you really need to go back to basics and look after your sleep schedule a bit better and make sure you're getting more sleep. Otherwise you won't be able to do um, clear meditation. So just practically speaking. Yeah, any follow-up thoughts from the leading committee about that? First of all, it's a very inspiring and uh, <clears throat> thoughtful uh, ideas that you have uh, that we try to import this uh, quality of uh, Empathy into what we are doing with our mind. I think it's a good, a good, uh, good channel of exploring uh, together. I think uh, it's a good, uh, good idea that came came up from from our discussions and from this brief. 
uh, <clears throat> I would like to ask you concerning the, the, what you what you have just said concerning you uh, the meditation my model meditation I thought that I could uh, trace some uh, not not of the point of view of uh, of uh, <clears throat> of what we are looking at, but the way, the mode of, of looking, of observing. And I thought that I had traced uh, some, some way stations in what he said uh, during, the, during the meditation that I wanted to ask you if, if I'm, if I'm uh, relying to something valid uh, in, your, in your eyes. I thought that the first, uh, first point was focusing. And then abiding, and then going beyond, and then a non dual dissolving. dissolving. So I thought that this is something that I took from this uh, first uh, listening, and I'm, of course, going to listen to it again and again and again. But could you refer to what, to this uh, tentative impression that I got? Yeah, I, I think it's a good it's a good summary of Lama Yeshi's advice, and you know we see this with Lama Yeshi that he gave very advanced instructions to very new students in very simple language, and it, it you know like he would just throw them right in the deep end with Mahamudra, with highest Yoga Tantra, with all sorts of things, with very little context, and just say, do that. And he would even say, now have a non-dual experience, go. <laughs> like as if you could just be like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, just have a non-dual experience, go for it. But it was in a way trusting that, I think that our imagination and our previous experience of these kind of merging, dissolving states is going enough in the right direction that even if it's not precise and even if it's not finished, it's still very useful and just make the attempt, just dive in head first and adopt the attitude that you're having this dissolving non-dual spacious experience of directly realizing emptiness, even though you haven't. It's like, it actually pulls you closer to it to adopt the attitude that you're already there. So the only danger is just that you might fool yourself into believing you've got the real realization when what you have is something that's moving in the right direction but isn't quite there yet and might not be quite there yet for a long time for maybe even many lifetimes. Still, there's a more experiential quality to the way he explains it than a lot of the teachers who talk more in terms of philosophical nuances and making sure you become very precise about what is negated and what is not negated. Lama would just say, go, <laughs> you know, just do. And I think it's a beautiful approach to use sometimes. Yeah, so I think you described it well. And uh, that book by Lama Yeshi, I really recommend. It's just called Mahamudra. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah. Um, and I've related to that, there was another question about what mental factors are it, or is it that are watching the mind? What is exactly kind of doing the work? So there was another question similar to Yael's the other day. There was another question like that. So um, I thought to just do a very brief um, reminder of minds and mental factors, just very brief, don't worry. <laughs> but remember, so namely you've got mental engagement, attention, right? Depending on your translator, which is one of the five omnipresent mental factors. So this one is always there naturally and continuously. It directs the mind accompanying it to a specific object of observation. So mental engagement, you know, moves or directs the mind here or there, but the difference between intention and mental engagement is that intention moves the mind to objects in general, whereas mental engagement directs the mind to a specific object. So this is happening, whether you're meditating or not, this is always happening in some way, whether it's 
conscious or unconscious, you know, this is a thing that's going on. But in meditation, we start to take that ability, that factor, and then bring other mental factors to it. So then you've got, you know, good old fashioned mindfulness, which of course in Buddhism is one of the five object ascertaining mental factors. So it's not as continuously present necessarily. And it just means non-forgetfulness with respect to a familiar phenomena. It has the function of causing non-distraction. So of course, mindfulness can be reinforced and stabilized by things like introspection, things like that. But basically you're attentive to an object and then you're not forgetting the object. You have it and you keep it or you keep coming back to it. And then you have concentration itself, which is of course translated sometimes as stabilization or absorption. It's that word in Tibetan, tingizin. And it's also one of the five object ascertaining mental factors. And this is like specific one pointedness of mind with respect to an imputed object. And it has the function as serving as the base of knowledge, special insight. So this kind of one pointedness is needed, particularly when you're developing calm abiding, particularly when you want this really powerful concentration that then can bring special insight to it and not be disturbed. So when we're doing a clarity of mind meditation, you find the mind, you don't forget the mind and you become single pointed or one pointed on the mind. You might have other mental factors join in and help. Um, you've got investigation, which is you know one of the four changeable mental factors, can be positive, can be negative. Hopefully when you're meditating, it becomes the positive form. So this is just an inquiry into the rough entities of objects as well as their names. And then of course, analysis itself, which is a fine discrimination of objects as well as their names. So general and specific. The point of all this is a lot is going on. <laughs> a lot is going on and you don't have to be too concerned about who is doing what. Your main concern is, are you awake? Yeah, are you present? Does your focus have that quality of kind of like brightness and vividness to it? I think it's useful to know the, the background mechanisms of how the mind works, particularly how the mental factors direct the mind. I think that's very useful. And then when you're actually meditating, don't worry about that knowledge so much. You know, it's like you workshop that in between sessions on the cushion, stay bright, stay alert, don't indulge your distractions. That same basic advice pervades. You get distracted, you notice you're distracted, you come back and you come back and you come back. So I don't know if that helps clarify or if it um, reminds you of a bunch of study that you need to review because it's been so long since you did minds and mental factors. But um, anyway, slowly, slowly. Um, there was another question from the same person and um, I'm not 100% if I've understood the question correctly. So if the questioner um, needs to clarify, pop on up. But they say, about thoughts as dreams, as Pema Chodron says, isn't it that they are dreams only if we forget that they aren't solid, inherent, existent, inherent nature? So the question seems to be saying, aren't, are things only dreamlike if we're confused? or we believe inherent existence. And it, you know, it's kind of going, it's going in the right direction, I think. But when we say things are dreamlike or illusory or don't exist in the way that they appear, that's true whether we understand about emptiness or not. There's always the appearance until we have a direct perceptual realization of emptiness. There's always the appearance of true existence constantly, all the time, until we have that realization. And when we have that realization, we only see the absence of inherent existence while we're in meditation. 
It's only in meditative equipoise that we don't have that problematic appearance. Even after you realize emptiness directly, things will still appear to you as inherent, but because of your realization, your belief is less. You don't believe the false appearance, but things are still dreamlike in the sense of being illusory or not as they seem. So that's what's meant by dreamlike. Dreamlike in the sense of not as they appear. Things appear truly existent or inherently existent, but they are in fact empty of inherent existence. So the word appear is tricky because it has like a connotation of sight when it's much more like a seeming. Yeah, like your friend seems to be helping you. It's a seeming that seems natural and choiceless. It's like the obvious quality that your strong opinions have. Like this is obviously true. That's an appearance, you know, or I am obviously self, you know, it's that appearance in that sense of the word. So I hope that that clarifies, but you can ask a follow-up if it doesn't. Maybe we shall make now an intermission that uh, people can ask. Uh, there was one more, one more question. You want, you want to, uh... To answer the third one before? Oh, uh, or not? Yeah. <laughs> As you wish. Um, because I have a, a plan for this for this question, which is a very very short video by His Holiness. That's only three minutes long. Um, so um, then, I, is it okay? Yeah. Okay. Well. So um, the the last question was about what does oneness mean in Buddhism? And, and I'm guessing the person is asking about oneness. One, because His Holiness does use the word oneness sometimes, but then myself and some of the other teachers in Buddhism resist that term. So then it's confusing, like why does His Holiness use it, but we are less prone to using it. And what His Holiness means, you know, I don't want to speak for His Holiness, but I want to kind of share some things about the Tibetan language. Um, the word for oneness and the word for sameness are basically the same. So like the word for one is cheek. Cheek means one. And when you are kind of talking to Tibetans, I remember this very clearly because it happened all the time when I lived in India. When I lived in India, I had a friend who was the same size, shape and color as myself same age, and Tibetans would say to us, oh, pachik machik, which sounds like one mother, one father. And I would ask my friend who had better Tibetan, she said, no, they're asking, do you have the same mother and the same father? They're asking if you're sisters. Yeah, pachik machik. Um, so the word for one and the, one, the word for same can be the same word in Tibetan. And when we say same in Tibetan, it has the connotation of like um, shared, yeah, of like shared. So when His Holiness says oneness, my feeling is that what he means is a shared experience of not wanting happiness or not wanting suffering and wanting happiness. The way he says that again and again, that's our shared humanity is having that drive. He also speaks about the oneness in the sense of interconnection, that we're, you know, one human race. We're not separate so distinctly as we are always presenting and having fights about. There's a shared humanity. But part of the reason for the resistance that some Buddhist teachers have to the word, I can speak for myself at least, is that if you live at Dharma centers for a long time, you hear a lot of well-meaning, sweet, new age people use the word oneness in a way that has so much loading of codependency and enmeshment and a sense of like merging into the universal ether and oneness in a way that avoids personal responsibility and doesn't understand that relatively all mental continuums are distinct, even if they're of similar types they are individual mental continuums. So that's part of at least my resistance to using the word.
but um, let's listen to what His Holiness says, just because it's always nice to hear what His Holiness says. I think many problems which we are facing is actually we emphasize secondary level of differences, religious, different religious faith, different nationality, different color, within same religious believer and same color, rich and poor, like that. So, uh, since a lot of man-made problem uh, due to too much emphasis on the secondary level of differences, now we must go to basic level, oneness of humanity. That, I think, very important. When I give you talk, when I meet you, if I feel, I sort of, I sort of keep some kind of feeling, I am Tibetan, I am Buddhist, then that mental state itself distance from you. Forget that, I am just one human being. The way my birth, the way you birth, your birth, same. The way, finally, death will be same. Sometimes I joking, joke, joke, oh, half joke, half so serious. When we passing through a cemetery, right? yeah, cemeteries. cemeteries, a lot of sort of cemeteries, that's our final destination. <laughs> uh, we have to go there. Rich or poor, powerful or also the poor, everybody, young, young. So no, yeah, eventually you also have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so nobody can escape, right? escape. escape. Uh, even Buddha. Uh, from Buddhist viewpoint, Buddha also, you see, went that way. Jesus Christ also went that way. Muhammad also, you see, has of course, went that, uh, that way. So therefore, it is our, whether we like it or not, it is our final destination. So when that destination is reached there, money, no use. Fame, no use. Power, no use. Weapon, no use. What sort of, what thing bring us Tranquility at that moment, our life spent, meaningful life, serving, helping other, not harming other. Then at that moment, feel very happy. That's very important. So, like he says, <laughs> um, are there any other questions? About the one is, it's about the the objection to the word, it's unknown also, I think, I uh, would like to know if it's right, uh, because we are in the uh, procedure of negating uh, uh, the, the object uh, inherent existence, one of the levels is refuting the being one with uh, the aggregate, so the oneness can be confused with this uh, aspect. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That, that's one of the pieces. Yep, exactly. There, there can also be a sense of like, um, oneness like you come into your own oneness like i don't know maslov's hierarchy and you're at the self-actualization and now you are a giant spiritual eye of oneness you know and it can get kind of a scary egoy vibe to it um so i don't want to you know not you know don't say you know don't use that word because of course how his holiness uses it is so beautiful and the way a lot of you use it is really beautiful I think it's just a matter of knowing in the back of your mind that word, like so many words, means something very specific to the individual saying it. And so it always needs a little bit of context. You know, it's like saying, what is Zionism? What is feminism? You know, it's going to have like a million definitions. So, you know, make sure you know what the person is talking about when they use the word. Make sure you know what you're talking about when you use the word. Yeah. So I want to pose question maybe 
It's very sim simple and low level, but I'm trying to understand something. Uh, if we, if you define, maybe I'm wrong, that emptiness is a character of everything. It's a character, for example, of a form. So would you uh, think that it's right to say that when you're asking, for example, in the meditation of equanimity, who is the I or the self that uh, loves someone or resents someone in mind, the answer that it is me who is lacking inherent existence, would it be correct? Yeah, yeah. It's like you go, it is me who lacks inherent existence, <laughs> you know, like yeah. two beats of pause, you know, you feel the me arise and then you release that concreteness. And if you release the concreteness, the attachment can dissolve, but the love can remain. Like that, yeah. So it's like this, how do you find the non-finding? And so a lot of, you know, rhetorical questions and open questions and investigative questions are presented to kind of like click you into finding the non-finding of inherently existent self which doesn't imply anything in its place. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, as you said. So the yeah. input of first, or it's smaller. <laughs> Yamina. No. <laughs> you know it's from the ways. Exactly. <laughs> I can't see you anyway, but that's fine. Uh, you, you, I, uh, I forget when you started talking today, I think one of the meditation about getting to the place of vacuum. And- uh, Place of what? You, you, you started talking today of the situation where we got by Mahamudra and uh, contemplating the mind through mind to the vacuum place, to vacuum. Vacuum. Vacuum, gotcha, yeah. yeah. Uh, would you, can you say more about it? Uh, well, it's a, it's a danger, you know, it's a common danger to fall into this feeling of uh, vacuum, you know, like um, the spaciousness turns into an absence, a nothingness, becomes somehow colored with then a uh, fear of annihilation or a feel of fear of nothingness, which leads to apathy, depression, hopelessness, or leads to who cares, hedonism, et cetera. You know, but when you're in the experience of you know, vast open spaciousness, for suddenly clouds to roll in like darkness and there to feel like just nothing, that's a danger. Um, it's a common danger. It happens to lots of people when they do this meditation. And, you know, I think that your philosophical understanding of emptiness can help save you from that or dispel that when it happens. Also, your bodhicitta. It's like, you know, suffering exists. You felt it yourself. You've seen it in your patients. You see it in your friends and family. You see it in your country. You know suffering exists. So how could there be nothingness? You also know there is joy and transformation and love and all of the good things. So you kind of use your awareness of the visceral lived experiences of your life to wake you back into there is something. And I need to understand the cause of suffering because I don't want to suffer and I don't want to cause suffering. You know, so you kind of get both your philosophical understanding of emptiness and your deep heart connection with bodhicitta to use like a dimmer switch to turn the light back on. You know, like as if it was a light switch, you know, it went into darkness and you need to turn it back up into lightness again. You use these ways of thinking to pull yourself from the abyss. Yeah, and if you keep falling into the abyss every time you do this meditation, stop doing this meditation for a while until your philosophical understanding is clearer. Yeah, and just do, you know, single pointed meditation on something maybe luminous and visual like the Buddha 
or something grounding and physical like the breath um, and, and say, I'll come back to clarity of mind, which evolves into Mahamudra later when I understand it better, or maybe when I have more merit to be able to touch it without as much danger. But uh, don't, you, don't you think that uh, getting to the uh, philosophical understanding is a kind of illusion as well? that can prevent us from getting, from giving ourselves to the bad? I mean, it's possible with all conceptions because all conceptions have, you know, a difficult quality to them, but you 100% need your conceptual mind to move into a perceptual experience. There is no avoiding conception in getting to an accurate perception. So you know that it's not perfect. You know that it's not finished. You know, what is the analogy in the Zen tradition? You know, the finger that points to the moon makes you look up at the moon, but it's easy to get lost in just the finger. You know, your conception is like the finger pointing. Don't stare at it, stare at what it's looking at. It's pointing you towards, yeah? Use it to direct your attention in the correct way. Don't get lost in the structures that led you there. So I, I think that it's not so much a danger for you because I think you know that conceptions can be deceptive, that conceptions are not the whole thing, but we do need them, we can't avoid them. We're just trying to get them organized into more and more accuracy so they become less and less problematic until eventually we don't need them anymore in the same way. I would like to joined to this uh, recommendation and uh, uh, to this uh, what we are always doing the connection between the experience far conceptualization uh, in order to cultivate our capability of uh, being experienced uh, near uh, so the connection between the philosophical and the experiential uh, also not dichotomous as we are feeling sometimes. Uh, the notion of a phrase that the uh, quote used be scientific psychotherapist or scientific psychoanalyst is referring to this kind of uh, uh, collaboration or, or unity between these two aspects which are different in the essences but they are a unity in some way. Uh, maybe it is uh, connected also to some of the questions that I uh, was asked uh, about uh, possible connections between uh, vicarious introspection uh, and the Mahamudra meditation. I think that uh, Junten's uh, idea of trying to uh, do some kind of uh, such connections within us is referring to this question. Uh, uh, what can what can uh, be useful for us in our med in our meditative uh, pose as empathetic uh, metrics uh, uh, during the analytic sessions from the Mahamudra uh, meditation uh, processing, and I think that the non-reactive, uh, spacious uh, way that we can uh, cultivate within the Mahamudra practicing surely can cultivate enormously our empathetic capability. That's, uh, that's for sure. Mickey, you wanted to? Yeah? I see you. I only wanted to make a remark about uh, the question of the maturity. And uh, I think that the psychoanalyst has got to go to it. I think that um, when we, the therapists, know about the, uh, the emptiness, uh, it's a potential, uh, not a maturity, it, it can help. Uh, uh, Winnicott has a new article, uh, which name is Nothing at the Center. And though the uh, woman, uh, with the duration, uh, fall into a beast. And he said that emptiness is a good point to begin. And, but 
emptiness can fall into Hosnishmaut, uh, into insignificant. And uh, emptiness, when you could say, if you place them, uh, can be a potentiality of the true self. But mm -hmm. it depends about the mother, the environment mother. If a person had a, in his life a primary maternal preoccupation, good, ma good enough mother, then the vacuity is the potential of the true self, potential of infinite possibility. So this is a place when I think that psychoanalysis meets uh, the philosophy of Buddhism and the presence of the self-object as a as a quiet presence that can join the person uh, from very, very, we say one day, a very, very uh, maternal, close uh, stance can help a person to feel this emptiness, this opportunity, potential in act the good. Okay? So it's also an experience, not also only a uh, conceptual invitation. So, what does Winnie Coates say is the true self? I think what Winnie Coates says is the true self is a potentiality. It's not something very um, substance. He never says that it's something, he doesn't uh, refer to it to a, as a substance. But as I understand, it's a potentiality. False self can be uh, the self. Solidified, but uh, the true self is the place where the movement is coming from, from uh, where the potentiality is coming. Okay. And and question for you and the leading committee: Is that similar to like uh, Di Martino, that paper that you guys are going through in Coat? Um, would you say that when they say true self, or they express? selfness, it, it similarly is referring to the potential of a human, but maybe not talking about what that finished potential is, but it's still, it's talking about potentiality from those other sources as well. Would, would you guys agree or describe it differently? Okay, you can be a representative. The short answer is yes. The long run, and will give you. Uh, other questions? <laughs> okay. Abigail. Hey. Do you have a question? Actually, I have a little story to ask. A little story that is uh, confusing me for a while. Um, uh, just before the coronavirus emerged to our life, I went to the post office and uh, there was a very long line of people waiting there. And uh, I was waiting with my wife to get. And suddenly someone um, um, approached towards me and asked me, asked me, are you the daughter of the librarian? And I said, yes, I am. And then she said how my mother saved her life. She was a very, um, she suffered with, uh, from um, um, learning disabilities. And I thought to myself, uh, she's talking about something that happened 35 or 40 years ago. I don't know her name. She doesn't know my name. And my question is, uh, what uh, from the, Buddhist um, um, point of view, uh, what, what it was it that she recognized in me? Yes, uh, it's not only that she recognized me, she recognized my mother in me. Um, and, you know, I have changed um, pretty much since then. <laughs> and uh, the second question is, um, um, Okay, I'll stay with the first one and then I will uh, call the other one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, of course, you probably recognize genetics, right? <laughs> you probably look like your mother, right? But um, 
but more than that, you know, I know basic answer, but um, there is, and there's, you know, familial movements that we mirror in each other. So of course, all that ordinary science stuff is true and Buddhists believe it's true as well. The other piece though can be karma, obviously, but karma in the sense of like, with lots and lots of familiarity with people, it's like there's a, a type of recognition or magnetism between people where you have a more immediate impression that seems closer to their conventional reality than your immediate impression of other people. So you have this kind of immediate impression of, I recognize you somehow. I know you somehow, even though you're new to me. And I feel that it's just one mental continuum meeting another mental continuum now you're in two different bodies, but you were recently around each other. So generally we just say if familiarity. Yeah, so, you know, in this life, you didn't know each other, but recently you did. That could be one reason. Sometimes this happens, yeah. What feels yeah. like that it wasn't changing in me. I mean, something hasn't changed for a long time. Well, it's changed, but it's stayed of a continuum, right? Like, don't think that things have to like burst into existence and then fall completely apart, like a flower blooms and then it dies. You can have similar traits for many, many lifetimes, but that's not to say that you're the same for many lifetimes. You know, there's a continuity that changes moment to moment, that adjusts in response to many stimuli, but there's like a pattern that's recognizable. You know, if you go to your favorite creek, you know, your favorite river when you're a child and then you come back to it 30 years later, you will recognize things about it and the landscape and the things, but you know, it's changing every second because water is moving and there is erosion and plants are born and die and whatever. But what you're recognizing is not the core essence of a river, it's a pattern of continuity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it's a nice story. Did you have a follow-up question? No? Okay. Dory? Hi. Hi. So, um, to translate it, there was a moment in the meditation of clarity of um, mind that about uh, five minutes, it's, it's rare, rare for me. I didn't see thought and uh, I saw something uh, between obscurity and lighter. And uh, I think it's uh, because I closed my eyes, but I didn't know if that is non-duality or um, because it was empty from from um, um, thoughts, object, and uh, thought, but I don't know. Is, is that the? <laughs> it sounds like closer to the conventional nature of mind, which is really important and really excellent. So, if you still felt like wakefulness with that experience it could be that you had an experience of the conventional nature of the mind the clarity and awareness that is present at the same time as your mental factors but is hard to recognize so if you can be in that space that you found be in that clarity and that openness and it can be imbued with your philosophical understanding of emptiness not with like strong analysis in that moment, but just from what you remember of your study, whatever little taste of emptiness you have, if you could kind of bring that to that experience and then let go again, it might be something closer to non-duality or closer to understanding of emptiness. So it's, it's a really positive step. It's hard to know because I have no clairvoyance. I can't see in there what, what happened, but it sounds like it's going the right direction. So non-duality, it's like uh, nothing in the, in the, in, in what I see. Uh, 
there is no 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 it's non-duality non-duality is not nothing non-duality is the dissolution of subject and object being so concretely distinct so it's a subtle point but you know it's it is an absence in a sense but it's not a void so you can feel it like it's it's difficult with words isn't it because it, it does start to sound like we're talking about nothingness but it's much more a dissolving of concreteness into spaciousness where subject and object are not so concrete yeah hey Michal. Hello. I wanted to ask you about um, if you can clarify the difference between compassion and love. And as I understand, as a therapist, I'm trying to cultivate uh, wisdom and, co and compassion. And I was um, um, confused because Ranan read us the beautiful teaching of the Buddha about the love faith. Uh, sutra. Sutra? Sutra? Oh, the Metta Sutra, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thinking in love with uh, the, in the deeds, deeds with love and the third one in the middle, sorry, I don't remember right now. Um, so I wonder, I would like to understand, because as I understand, I can, I don't try to cultivate love. That's a byproduct. That's a product. So maybe I'm not. I would like to understand. Yeah, it's a good question. I I like it. Um, you know, uh, we have to start with the technical definition because we are the Gulukpa tradition, and that is our way. <laughs> but um, you know, compassion the wish for others to be free from suffering or the wish for all sentient beings to be free from suffering. Love, the wish for all sentient beings to have happiness. So, you know, in words, those are the definitions. In terms of experience, the words really help because compassion is not kind of raw empathy in the colloquial sense of the word. Maybe it's empathy in the psychoanalytic sense of the word, but it's not just being with someone suffering. It's not just holding the space for someone suffering or wishing them freedom from suffering in a kind of passive, I hope it goes better for you kind of way. It's awareness of suffering with awareness of the potential for freedom. So to wish all sentient beings free from suffering, you have to be able to see suffering and acknowledge the potential for freedom both simultaneously, which is why there is no such thing as compassion fatigue if it's actual compassion. There's certainly empathic distress. There's certainly burnout. There's certainly just regular tiredness. But if you're actually in compassion that can bear witness to even the worst suffering while still holding the fact that suffering is not the nature of the person who has it. Suffering is not their ultimate reality, that their final potential is to be free from that. And no matter how bad it gets for them, they cannot ruin that potential. Their potential for freedom is always present. So it's in a way holding I don't know if this is the wrong way to express it using your guys's language, but maybe it's like somehow having both mirroring and idealization simultaneously. So yeah, you're mirroring like this. So for us, we have to use them as separate skills, kind of alternating, but maybe eventually they can merge or become together. Um, when we're tired, when it's hard to see someone suffering, I think it's because we've forgotten their potential for freedom or we've invested responsibility that is the wrong type. It's like in one sense, we're responsible for the welfare of all sentient beings, but that doesn't mean we're all in their business trying to fix stuff. It means an open, expansive, I am here for you. Sometimes that is directly applicable 
sometimes it isn't. I hold open the space of I care for you. And if the tools I have to offer are useful, take them at any time. If they're not, I'm still here and present. I don't resent you for not using them. I don't feel bad about myself for not having more of them. I'm just here, <laughs> you know? So with love, you cultivate it in, in many ways. Sometimes understanding compassion is easier because suffering is more obvious. But what is happiness exactly? And how do you wish people to have happiness? And it requires a little bit of thinking about karma. You know, the substantial cause for happiness is positive, constructive behaviors. They're of benefit. That's the substantial cause. The, co the conditions, however, are so varied. You know, what is a condition to water and ripen one person's seeds for happiness can be very different than someone else's. So it's, it's a delicate thing, but I think mostly we're trying to give people our conditions for happiness rather than looking at the substantial causes. You know, we're saying here, you look like you could have more happiness, take this chocolate. Chocolate is often a condition for my seeds of virtue to ripen as happiness take here, you know, which is lovely and kind, but a deeper form of love would be to think, how can I create conditions where their most positive potentiality can come forth? How can I create space for them to live their highest ideals or their deepest heart connections? Because that's the cause of the deep happiness and the sustainable happiness. You know, the summary to Michal's question is really, you know, we need to have uh, equanimity first, and then love and compassion can grow from there very easily and organically, particularly if we bring wisdom to it. No, me? Yes, my, my question is, um, I can imagine very clearly that I wish um, freedom from suffering and happiness for the people I dislike or yeah, that, that I think are doing very much harm in, in this country. But <laughs> the, the thing is that I wish for them to be happy and free of suffering in order for them to be better in their conduct. So is that um, egocentric of me or? <laughs> Only you know. <laughs> Probably not though. It's, it's I, I look, really there's like, yeah. Be, like in a better place, so they will do less harm. But... Yeah, yeah. Look, that, that side of equanimity is very valid and very practical. You know, it is just very practical to think if they had more wisdom, if they had more compassion, if they had better behavior, if they suffered less, they would do less harm. And that would be great. I wish that for them. But equanimity is really starting from your internal attitude about them. It's really starting from how do I speak to myself in such a way that I stop giving them the power to steal my peace? Because when you see their bad behavior or what you label as bad behavior, yeah, more delicately, what you label as bad behavior, and maybe conventionally it is, maybe ethically it is, I'm guessing at your politics, I'm guessing I probably agree with them, but it's like, never mind that, start with the mentality. You allow their bad behavior to steal your peace, which means that your amazing expansive mind will have less cre creativity less spontaneity for positive solutions and for present moment peace because an affliction has gotten a hold of you and agitated the mind. So it's become like boiling water that can't reflect things accurately. So equanimity is like, how do you stop people, your, stop yourself from giving up power? And then from that place, you know, what you actually wish for them in daily life, the activities and behaviors you choose, et cetera, et cetera. But you know, start with why do I let their behavior 
turn me into something I don't like? What are my ways of thinking that made me tunnel vision? I, I don't think they, they make me something I don't like. I think they're, they have so much power, like as politicians, they, they do a lot of harm uh, to, the, to, to many, many people. Not just me. I'm yeah, I'm sure they do. I'm sure they do, but that's not the point of the practice, right? The point of the practice is what is your internal response to that? And what makes you withhold affection? What makes you withhold care? And to dissolve that into such a way that someone can do the worst thing possible and you care about them as much as you care about your children, same. And you're not saying bad behavior is good. Equanimity is not saying bad behavior is good or people I label this way are somehow magically that way. It's like the labels exist, you acknowledge where they come from and you even out your open heart so despite the labels you give, you're able to have that pervasive, unbiased compassion, et cetera. Do you know what I mean? Thank you. Yeah. Rama? It's, it's interesting that you are using the word pervasive uh, to this uh, process because somehow it's, it's really the antidote for the pervasive uh, suffering. Uh, so equanimity might be uh, the remedy, uh, first of all, for of our minds. And from this, it will radiate uh, to broader circles. Okay. Okay, meditation.